Before the, uh, the worship team scatters and runs away, uh, maybe we can just take a moment to appreciate them. I know this morning I was really blessed by the worship. These guys come, you know, Thursday, Saturday, early Sunday morning to rehearse. Uh, can we just show our appreciation of the worship team, the AV team? Thank you, guys. Well, this past week, a couple days ago, I believe, uh, I went to the dentist. And I think in the past five months, I've been to the dentist five times. Uh, the dentist I go to is, is Maya, one of our church members. Now, whenever I meet Maya at church or, or, or outside of church for another you know, meeting, I enjoy it. I like Maya. We have a good conversation. I always enjoy seeing Maya. But I must confess, I don't enjoy seeing Maya when I meet her at the dentist's office because I know there is going to be some pain. I know there's going to be some discomfort. I know I'm going there because there's something wrong with my teeth that needs to be fixed. And of course, Maya does her best to make me feel comfortable. She does a great job. But I simply just don't like going to the dentist. It's not one of my top 10 places to go. And for my whole life, all of my visits to the dentist, they all end in the same way. They always say, hey, you, you have pretty good teeth. So if you just you know, brush your teeth a little bit more every day, if you, if, you, if you flossed even just a little bit, then there would be no problem. And I know they're not lying to me. I know that they're telling me the truth. In fact, usually the first few days after going to the dentist, I brush my teeth a little more, I, I brush for a longer time, sometimes I even floss. But after about a week, two weeks, I go back to my old ways. My brushing time decreases, my flossing time decreases, let's say, to zero, and the fear of going to the dentist starts to fade away, and I just go back to my old habits. This can be true of us spiritually sometimes, can it? God shows us something in our lives that he wants, to, wants to, uh, to change within us, something that he wants to grow within us. God shows us something that he wants us to trust him with, to have faith about. He shows us something in our life that isn't good, that he wants, to, he wants you to get rid of. And we think, okay, let's do it. And we start out strong, it's going well. But then after some time, after a little bit more time, it's right back to our old ways. So how do we as believers actually change? How do we actually grow? How do we take a real step forward without always taking two steps back? Well, that's what we're going to look at this morning. So if you have a Bible, please turn with me to uh, 1 John chapter 4. We also have the text on the screen for you. We've been studying this book the past few weeks. And we're getting closer to the end. Uh, likely next Sunday will be our last Sunday in 1 John. But at the end of chapter 4, John is going to go back to some of the themes he's already talked about in this letter so far. In other words, John really wants us to catch the idea that he's been talking about. So if you didn't catch the idea in chapters 1, 2, or 3, he really wants to, to make sure that you catch it by chapter 4. So look with me, 1 John chapter 4. Uh, beginning in verse 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love God does not know God, because God is love. The reminder here again is to love each other. Why? John says, because love comes from God. God is the source of love. Love for each other is a sign of, of being born again, is a sign of knowing God intimately. John says that anyone who doesn't love doesn't know God. Why? Because that person's heart has obviously not been changed by the love of God if they don't love others. In other words, the love of God should flow out of us because love comes from God. And as it says in verse 9, God is love. It's one of God's attributes. You know, on Wednesday night, we have our, our foundations course in the church office, and we've been walking through the Bible, specifically the Old Testament, and it's been amazing as we study the Old Testament to, to read about God reaching out in His love constantly to His people, Israel, in the Old Testament. 
You know, sometimes we hear that in the Old Testament, God is angry, but in the New Testament, God is loving. But when you read the Old Testament, you see God constantly reaching out in love to his people, showing them the right way to go, showing them the right things to do. But they may follow God for a little while, but pretty soon they reject him, they go back to their old ways, they even go after other gods. But again, God reaches out to them again. He tries to warn them. Think about how many pages in our Bible are filled with the prophets, right? This is God speaking through the prophets, trying to warn Israel about what would happen if they didn't obey. And you don't warn somebody if you don't care about them. You don't warn somebody if you don't love them. But despite God's warnings, Israel decided not to listen to him, and of course, they suffered the consequences. But this love of God flows out of the Old Testament into the New Testament as God sends Jesus his son. Verse 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us in his love is perfected in us. We see in these verses that God's love for us isn't just a feeling, right? But his love, God's love for you, is displayed in action. His love was manifested, it said, by sending Jesus Christ into the world so that by believing in him, we might have eternal life and salvation in Christ, that we can be forgiven, we can be set free. It says here again that Jesus was the propitiation for our sins. John used this word back in chapter 2. And propitiation might seem like a long and sort of, you know, technical word. But propitiation, when we understand it, is one of the most glorious words of all time. Because propitiation means that instead of us paying the penalty for our sin, Jesus, in his love, went to the cross and paid the penalty for our sin himself. Because of propitiation, we can be reconciled to God. We can walk in the light. And John makes it clear in these verses that this wasn't some kind of 50-50 partnership. It wasn't like we were walking on the same road as God or we were working towards the same goal as God. No, God stepped in. God acted. Which leads me to my first point, and that is simply God's love takes the first step. God's love takes the first step. In Romans chapter 5, it says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God took the first step to us in love. God initiated. We didn't initiate with God. He initiated with us. God took the first step. So in verse 11, when it says that If God so loved us, then we should love one another. I think our example for love is God. Meaning, we shouldn't just wait for other people to love us first. We shouldn't just react with love. I think God calls us to take the first step with love. We should reach out to one another in love, even if we feel like the other person doesn't deserve it. Right? God didn't love us 50-50. Therefore, we can't expect to love people 50-50 too, even though it would be nice. This kind of love, this first step kind of love, loving people when they don't deserve it, verse 12 says that this kind of love shows that the supernatural love of God is at work in your life. John says, no one is seeing God, but people can see God in you when you love this way. You know, maybe there's a relationship in your life right now that needs some work. Maybe there is a conflict, maybe it was recent, or maybe it was a long time ago, and, you know, things aren't the way that they used to be. And maybe you and this other person are simply just waiting for the other person to apologize. You're waiting for the other person to say, I'm sorry, you're you're waiting for the other person to say, please forgive me. But the truth is, both of you could be waiting forever. 
What is needed to restore that relationship is for someone to take the first step, just like God did with us. And maybe that other person will take the first step, but I wouldn't count on it. <laughs> the truth is you can't control what the other person does, but you can control what you do. You can be the one to take the first step. You know, whenever I talk to, to married couples who are having a crisis uh, in their relationship, it's typically the same story. Something happens, and one person feels hurt. Then the other person starts to feel hurt. And then each person feels so hurt, they start to put up a wall. And because of that wall, they can't really understand the other person because they feel so hurt. And couples can get stuck in this place for years. Not just couples, but in any, in any relationship. But the thing that can make those walls come down is when someone in the relationship takes the first step towards the other person. It's when they say, hey, I'm sorry, please forgive me. It's when they take their hurt and they you know, put it on the bookshelf for a moment so they can try to understand what the other person is going through. God reached out to you first in love. God took the first step. Is there someone in your life right now that you need to take that first step towards today? It won't be easy, for sure. But that kind of love, that first step love, is proof that God is alive, and it's proof that God is working in your heart. Verse 13 says, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father who has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. Again, John is repeating some of the same themes we, he talked about earlier. We looked at this word uh, to abide a lot in chapter 2. To abide means to remain or to stay in place. It has this sense of, of lasting and, and enduring. And so when we display this first step kind of love, it's more proof that we have a relationship with God and that God has a relationship with us. And when we enter into that relationship with God, when we confess the, and believe that Jesus indeed is the Savior of the world, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and abides in us, dwells in us. This is another way of saying what John said in verse 12. No one has seen God. But when we love in this way, it's clear that we have a relationship with God. It's clear that we believe in Jesus. It's clear that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. As Jesus said in John 13, he said, The world will know your, uh, my disciples by your love for one another. So the world doesn't know you're a Christian by you wearing a shirt that says, I'm a Christian. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, the world will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. This first step kind of love. Verse 17. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, as he is so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So as God grows us, as his love is perfected in us, we can have confidence. This is another theme of 1 John. We can have assurance of our faith. We can be confident in our faith. We can be secure. Right? God doesn't want you to be insecure about your faith. God wants you to be secure. So the Bible teaches that in the future there will be this day of judgment. When Jesus will judge the world according to what they have done. And sometimes when we hear that, it can be easy to be a little scared or, or be a little bit, you know, afraid. But John says, you don't have to be afraid. On the contrary, you can be confident. Why? Back to the P word, propitiation. As believers, Jesus took our place uh, by paying for our sins on the cross. So when it comes time for judgment... There's nothing to judge because Jesus has already paid for our sin. Therefore, we can be confident on Judgment Day, not because of anything that we have done, but because of the work of Christ. 
This is what John means in verse 18. I think John is still specifically talking about Judgment Day here, and he's saying that, hey, if Jesus abides in you, if God's work is, if God is, God's love is at work in your life, then there's nothing to fear about Judgment Day. Because fear has to do with punishment. But as we just said, Jesus already took the punishment for us. So there's nothing to fear. I think this is a real important verse for us to catch to understand God most clearly. So let me ask you this question this morning. What do you think God's attitude is towards you right now? How does the God of the universe feel about you today at whatever, 1215, right in this moment? Do you think he's frustrated with you? Do you think he's angry with you? Do you think he's disappointed with you? What do you think God's attitude is towards you right now? Let me say it this way. If your answer has anything to do with fear, then it's the wrong answer. Because if Jesus Christ abides in you, then God's attitude towards you in this moment is love. He is your Loving Father. As we said a few weeks ago, God is not Darth Vader from Star Wars. He's not the scary father that you always need to be afraid of. He's our loving Father. He cares about you. He delights in you. He loves you. There, there's no fear in love. Rather, love pushes out that fear, verse 18 says. There's a worship song out right now that says this truth really well. It says, I could never be more loved than I am right now. God doesn't love you any more, and God doesn't love you any less on your best day and on your worst day. There's no fear in love. So let me ask you that question again. What do you think God's attitude is towards you right now? I hope that now you'll answer the question with 100% certainty that God loves you. Right? Kids understand this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells us so. The Bible tells us the truth. The, the Bible isn't the problem. The problem is typically ourselves. We gravitate towards fear. We gravitate towards thinking God's disappointed in this and all these things. Jesus loves you. This you know, for the Bible tells you so. Verse 19 we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Again, verse 19, God loves us with a first step kind of love. We love because he first loved us, it says. And at the end of chapter 4, John goes back to something he talked about back in chapter 2. Apparently back then there were some people in the church who claimed to be walking in the light, but they actually hated other people in the church. And John says, this can't be. If someone hates his brother or sister in Christ, that person is not in the light. Rather, that person is walking in the darkness. In other words, they, they fail the test. But on the other hand, the person who loves other people in the church, that person is walking in the light. That person passes the test, let's say. To put it simply, hate equals darkness, but love equals light. As we said back in chapter 2, loving one another isn't a suggestion from God. Loving your brother or sister in Christ isn't some kind of add-on that you can take or leave. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. There's no exceptions. There's no qualifiers. But again, this is the gospel message. The Bible says we, when we were sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, God invited us to his mercy and grace when we didn't deserve it. Jesus took the first step towards you while we were walking away from him. We forgive because Jesus forgave us. We reconcile with others because God reconciled us to him. As Jesus said in the gospels, it's easy to love someone you get along with. 
But the message of the gospel is loving someone even when you feel like they don't deserve it. And in verse 21, it says this is a, a package deal. Whoever loves God must love his brother or sister. You can't opt out of it. You can't just love one. You can't just love God and say, oh, I'm just going to love God, but people, no thanks. It says it's a package deal. We're called to love God, and we're called to love each other. Chapter 5, verse 1. It says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father uh, loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Verse 1 reminds us again of a theme we looked at earlier in this book as well. Being born again. Jesus said, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Not physically, but spiritually. That your heart must be transformed. So to be born again means to have a, a new place, a new start, a new, a new uh, a, a, a life in Christ. Right? You can't be born again without dying. So when we believe in Jesus Christ... Our old life with, before Christ has died, and we can be spiritually born again, we can be regenerated. And it says here, a sign of being born again is that we love each other and we obey the commandments of God. This shows the world that Christ abides in us. And in verse 3, it says that we love God by keeping His commands. I mentioned this before, but a few years ago, I, I, I started asking myself the question, you know, what does it mean to love God? After all, Jesus said that the, the greatest commandment, the first commandment, is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. But I was thinking, what does that mean? Does it mean I get all of these you know, warm and, and fuzzy feelings and emotions when I, when I think about God? Does it mean every time you know, we sing a song to God in worship that I you know, cry a little bit? Is that what loving God is all about? Well, if it is, I, I can't really relate to that. I mean, I don't always want to cry. I'm, that's just not me. So does that mean I don't love God because I'm not full of emotion and weeping? So I wanted to study this more, and I, and I searched the Bible for what does it mean to love God? And I found in many places the truth that we read about here in verse 3, that loving God means keeping His commandments. Look at me at John chapter 15, verse 10. Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my commandments and abide in his love. It says this in 2 John 1, 6. It says, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. John chapter 14, verse 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Therefore, to love God does not require us to have some emotional experience, though that our emotions are part of it. But to love God is to obey His commandments. Which means that you can love God and abide in His love by having its integrity when you're at work. You can love God by honoring your parents. You can love God by forgiving your enemy. You can love God by being joyful in really difficult circumstances. You can love God by keeping your word, by letting your yes be yes and your no be no. You can love God by choosing to be joyful. You can love God by praying to Him. You can love God by being generous to people. You can love God by not gossiping at, at work or at school. You can love God by being pure sexually. I could go on and on and on. But I think you get the point. Loving God isn't about just having a six-hour worship time, though that is a way to, to love God. But my point is, you can love God all day long by simply obeying His commands. You can love God at the store. You can love God while you're walking home. You can love God while waiting on the train. Love for God is keeping His commandments. And John adds at the end of verse 3 that God's commandments are not burdensome. And that leads me to my, my second point, And that is simply, loving God is easy. I mean, that's 
what the verse says, right? Loving God means keeping his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. They are not heavy. Jesus also said this in, in Matthew chapter 11, uh, verses 28 through 30. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. So back then, a yoke was, was a harness that you could put on animals so that they could you know, help carry things. So Jesus is saying, my teaching is not a heavy thing for you to put on your back and carry. It's a light thing. And back then at that time, the Pharisees were, were teaching people that they had to do so many things to be righteous before God. It was a self-righteousness, which is basically the opposite of the grace of God. And this teaching or this yoke was heavy for the people back then. There were so many things to do, and it didn't solve the problem of sin. But Jesus comes along and shows them a more excellent way. He says that my, my teaching is easy and my burden is light. How can that be true? As we said earlier, Jesus carried our burden for us to the cross. He paid for our sin. So I would say from these verses, loving God is easy. But sometimes we can make it so hard. Instead of giving Jesus our burdens for him to carry, we try to carry them ourselves, which Jesus never intended for us to do. Because it's in Jesus that our souls find refuge. It's in Jesus that our souls find rest. In other words, if you're weary and if you're tired this morning, the best solution is not to go spend a day at the spa and, and getting a massage or getting a manicure, though that, that would be nice. The best solution is to run to Jesus, the Good Shepherd, to cast your cares upon Him. He is our, our hiding place, our safe refuge, our comforter. Go to Him today. If you're weary and weak, He says that He will give your soul rest. That's a promise from Him to you. Because we're all battling something. We're all dealing with something. We're all carrying something. And Jesus looks at us and says, Come to me with that. This life is not easy. You know that. We all know that. But the Bible says that loving God is. We can love God by keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Jesus' teaching is not heavy, but it's light. Most of the time, we already know what to do, but the question is simply, will we do it? As I said at the beginning, I'm never really surprised by what the dentist tells me to do. It's always the same commands, right? Brush your teeth more, floss more. And those commandments aren't burdensome. It's not a lot of extra work. The dentist is trying to, to help me. Maya's trying to help me, right? If I did those simple things, my teeth would be fine. There'd be less pain and more health. The commandments, or the commands aren't burdensome, the commands are simple. It simply comes down to me doing it. But there's a big difference in following the dentist commands and following the commands of God. And that is when we try to follow the commands of God, we don't have to do it in our own power. We don't have to do it in our own strength because the Holy Spirit abides in you. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. He guides you. He teaches you. He intercedes for you. I'll say it like this, the more you try to follow the commands of God in your own power, the more you're going to fail. That's the truth. But the more you open your heart to the Spirit, the more you allow God to work in your life, the easier it is to follow the commands of God. Because it's God working in you and through you, rather than you trying to do it for God. The Bible says when we are weak, He is strong in us. Not the other way around. Life is hard, but loving God is easy when we come to Him for rest for our souls. You might think you need the spa or the massage, and there's nothing wrong with those things. 
But what you need most is him. Let's close with verses 4 and 5. It says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Another theme we've seen in 1 John, that if we have believed in Jesus Christ, we have overcome the world. When John talks about the world, he's talking about a, a system or ideology that is opposed to God. But as believers through Jesus Christ, we have overcome the world through faith. As I said earlier, we're all in some kind of battle today. We're all going through something. We're all dealing with something. And maybe today it starts to feel like you're losing that battle a little bit. But just remember, the Bible says you're an over comer. You will see a victory. In Jesus Christ, you are on the winning team. So hold on. Keep the faith. Hold the line. Keep fighting the good fight of faith. Hang in there. Because the Bible says you will not be defeated. On the contrary, by faith, we will overcome. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you reveal yourself to us. We thank you for your, your commands. And God, sometimes we make them burdensome. You don't make them burdensome. They're the path to life. They're the path to, to freedom. So Father, help us to get out of our own way. Let us try not to do these things in our own power, but help us to do these things through your power, through your spirit that abides in us. And Father God, whatever relationship in our life there is right now that needs some work, whatever person you put in our hearts, God, let us not wait for them to take the first step. Because God, the truth is you took the first step towards us. So God, give us the courage, give us the boldness to take that first step towards the people in our life that you want us to. We can't do it in our own power, God. We need you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.